I guess yesterday, it's fair to say, we witnessed an extraordinary event. For many of us, perhaps it was the first coronation that we have witnessed. For some of us, it might have been the second. It was a traditional show of British pomp and ceremony yesterday, with all the usual processionals that go with such a royal occasion. It was also an opportunity for the millions of people around the world watching what was happening at Westminster Abbey to witness a distinctly Christian service. The words that were said, the words that the king said, it was distinctly Christian. It wasn't watered down, despite the fact there was other denominations and other faiths present. It was the Church of England doing what the Church of England actually does quite well. The theme of the coronation service was all about faith and service. That's what it was titled as. And I think that is what came through in the service yesterday as we watched. There were also some very sacred moments that happened in that service as the world watched. And for one, I'm glad that the screen was around Charles when he was anointed because that will have been a very private, special moment between him and the Lord. And obviously the Archbishop of Canterbury as he anointed A lot of people might have looked yesterday, though, and thought, well, that's great. The king has everything. He's in the highest authority. He's the head of state, the supreme governor of the church. And in human terms, I suppose that's right. He is the head of state. You know, it buck stops with him, if you like, really. But I was particularly moved by some of the words that he said. Now, I'm not going to begin to try and understand how much of a Christian Charles is. I'm not going down that route today. But the words that he said, surrendering himself to the Lord, whether he meant them or not, the Lord will have taken them as words that that Charles was declaring. He publicly declared that he will follow the Lord's command. The very opening of the coronation service was very powerful, I thought. A young chorister greets the king with the words, Your Majesty, as children of the kingdom of God, we welcome you in the name of the King of Kings. Wow. And the first thing that Charles says in that service, in his name, and after his example, I come not to be served, but to serve. I come not to be served, but to serve. Just the words of Jesus, the words that we've just sung in the servant king. In many ways, I suppose that is the life of a monarch. They don't get the chance to live their own life. They're in the public eye wherever they go. They're often watched with scrutiny. There's royal correspondence reporting on everything that happens. There's the big news stories over the years about the family. I've actually I've used Audible and I've listened to Prince Harry's spare It was a very interesting thing, obviously taking it with a pinch of salt, obviously coming from one perspective, but just the the fact that they can't really do anything. I was particularly taken when he said he and Meghan once had to get dressed up in disguise just to go to Waitrose to get their shopping so that they could cook their dinner. As I say, I don't know how true all of it is, but it it was an interesting listen anyway. But even with all of that, the monarch is there, sat here as a serve. Whatever our views on the monarchy, whether we're sat here as a royalist, whether we're sat here as a republican, or somewhere in between, it's possible to see that the monarch lives a life of service. They have the means to be able to do so. And that was the example that we saw from the late queen. An entire life dedicated to service of the people and the nation. Yesterday afternoon, Dean and I were chatting And we were thinking about the question, well, what sort of king is Charles going to be? Is he going to follow the example of his mother? Because that's the um, the only monarch he's ever known. Will he follow her example and do what she did? Or will he carve out a path of his own and become a different sort of monarch, become the monarch that Charles wants to be? And in many ways, already, we've seen him start to carve out his own path. The coronation, it was sustainable. There wasn't many new things made. They reused things. He said there's no need. It was toned down from, I think it was about three and a half hours with Elizabeth. It was toned down. 
but there was still that Christian message and there was still all of the stuff that needed to be in there to make it formal or legal, whoever decides these things. And it really got me thinking after that conversation with Dean that there comes a point in each of our lives where we have to take that step and do our own thing. We have to spread our on. In many ways, our own path. Whatever journey life takes us on, in many ways, we all get to the point like Charles did yesterday, where we take command. Perhaps and probably, it's not with all of the ceremonials associated with the coronation. For me, the ordination, ordination, yeah, that is quite ceremonial. Again, it's something the Church of England does really well, all the robes and everything and the music and, and the, all that. But whatever it is for you, there comes a point when we have to say, now is the time to step up. Whether that's done in a church service, whether that's done in your life, in your job, wherever it is, we get to that point where we say, right, now I'm free to go. Perhaps there's many who've guided and supported us to where we are now, to the place that we have come to. To me, that came very sharply into focus last weekend. At Letton Hall on the Sundays we were having breakfast, I discovered that somebody who was influential in me coming back to faith, starting to preach, somebody who was influential in helping me get involved with youth work, which then led me on the path to ordination, had died. I got a text from a friend who I've not spoken to for a while. And he said, I'm really sorry to let you know, Tim, that Carol passed away this morning. She's the sort of person who you think would live on forever. You know the sort of people they are. She, de- she had dedicated her life to serving youth. She'd run a cypher venture for at least 25 years, which was served by two of my, one of my brothers, one of my sister and myself, at different points in time. And when I helped out, I was leading a group there with a chap who'd been in a group led by my brother many years before. There was a lot of good work that happened. When I came back to faith and returned to church, she was the one who got me involved with the youth work. I think she was the first person who gave me the opportunity to speak. The very first spe- talk I did in, in, this, in a preaching context was to a group of youth, youth at this cypher venture. That's where I discovered my love of preaching and reliance on the Holy Spirit to be able to explore and explore the Word of God and to preach the Word of God. And that's when I started exploring ordination. And perhaps if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today wearing one of these and preaching the Word of God. Then on Friday this week, I was in Booker of all places, and I discovered that the naval chaplain who I'd worked with for a year had died suddenly, age 57, and I was just in a complete state of shock. He was the chaplain of the fleet. He'd only just retired from the Navy. And I, just, I got a message from a friend of mine from Plymouth that said, we're in shock. We've just found out that Martin has died. Again, he is another person who, if he hadn't have intervened in my life, I would definitely not be standing here today. I can assure you of that. He was the DDO for the Navy, and he was the one who helped prepare me for my selection conference. He was so gracious when I was asking all sorts of random questions about ministry and what it means, what does the public ministry mean, you know, what, why do you do this, why do you do that, they were in a, he was very much an Anglo-Catholic, they did things very differently to we do here, and the first day he said to me, ask any question you want, nothing is too silly, and that was one of the best things that he could have said, and then on Friday evening I was chatting to Amanda, and I was sort of saying in my eyes, those, there are two spiritual giants who I feel that I have lost over that last weekend. And in some ways, I got the sense of, they've gone, it's now over to me. Now, yes, I've not spoken to them for a while, but there was still that sense of, they've gone, it's now over to me to carry on that work. And I wonder, I wonder, is that how Charles felt when his mother died and he became king? There comes a point for all of us when those who have trained us leave us for whatever reason, whether it's death, if it's in, the, in the work, whether it's retirement, whether somebody moves away. There comes a point where we have to take up that place and start to carve out our own path. For those of us as Christians, we proclaim a kingdom that is not of this world. Even the rulers of the world come under 
his authority. That's what we saw yesterday in that service. Charles made promises before God that he would faithfully serve the people as monarch. When we become Christians, whether at the moment we accept Jesus into our lives, the moment we get baptized or confirmed, we declare that we will faithfully serve a king throughout our life. And in many ways, the greeting of that chorister to the king yesterday could be said to me and to you. As children of the kingdom of God, we welcome you in the name of the King of Kings. And we too can reply, in his name and after his example, I come not to be served, but to serve. Those words could be said to us. And we can reply in the same way that the king replied. Because we are called to follow the example of Jesus. We are called to serve those around us. It was very fitting we had the servant king, and Steve didn't know what I was speaking on, apart from the passage, but to have the servant king. He comes not to be served, but to serve. But when we do that, human nature always creeps in. And I think that's what's so human about that passage from Luke today. There was a dispute among them. Which one of us is the greatest? How often have we been in that situation? How often have we tried to be the greatest? We're very good at it in the church. How much do I do in the church? How much time do I spend in the church? How much money do I give to the church? How many different roles can I have? I want to be recognized for my sacrifices. I want people to know what I do. It's a game that we play, and it's not just in the church. It's out in society. Perhaps it's in work. When I was a lawyer, it used to be, how many cases have you issued at the, at the small claims court today? When I was in employment, how many times have you been in touch with the tribunal today? Oh, look, you've got 100% answering your calls. You've only got 98%. Well, you need to work better next week. It's, in, it's ingrained in human nature that we try and become the best person at the cost of others. And it creeps into the church, and then it becomes a comparison game. Well, they do more than me. Are they a better Christian? Steve's been in church six days this week. I've only been in five. Is he better than me? Well, they only gave a pound that week. I gave two, so I must be better than them. The comparisons continue wider. Well, that church down the road, they've 200 on the electoral roll. Why have we only got 62? Come on, Lord. Look, down there, they've got 10 worship leaders. We don't even have one. Why? It's so easy to get into that mindset. But it's damaging. It is very damaging. And Jesus is very clear in his reply to the disciples in verse 26. You are not to be like that. You are not to be like that. The one who rules should be like the one who serves. That, this passage is coming just after the institution of the Lord's Supper. It's taking us back to Monday, Thursday. Judas has agreed to betray Jesus. And if we read just a few verses later, Jesus tells Peter that he will deny him three times. So at this particular point in time, we can see that Jesus knows he is going to be alone. He knows what is coming. He knows he'll be betrayed. He knows he'll be denied. And he knows that he will be going to be killed alone. And perhaps in some ways, that's also how we can model Jesus in our lives. That's the, what life as a Christian can entail. One who is entrusted with a vision, a vocation, a particular ministry. Find that as it's carried forward, there's misunderstanding. There's opposition, doubt, denial, even from close friends. As I speak to candidates about discerning if ordained ministry is for them, one of the things we ask is ministry can and sometimes is a very lonely place. How will you manage? How will you manage if the church is against you? If the people are against you? Ministry can feel isolating and lonely at times. The times when God has spoken to me as a church leader but not to the PCC, it can feel very lonely. 
There are times when I sense the Lord asking me to say something during a talk, and I'm thinking, what, really? You want me to say that, but that's going to make me unpopular? Well, guess what, Tim? It's not a popularity contest. I'm not here to become friends with everybody as much as I'd like to. I'm here to do what the Lord is asking me and to lead this church forward in the power of the Holy Spirit. Despite my human objections to the Lord, he still makes me do what I do. I have that choice to make. Do I do what he's asking me or do I just sort of you know, skip around it? But I try to be as faithful as I can and act as the Lord has said. And I'm sure for each of you, there's many times when you can pinpoint something in your life where perhaps you've had a vision from God. You've had a picture from God. You thought, yes, this is what I want to do. This is what we need to do. But nobody else agrees. It's a lonely place, friends. It is a lonely place. But we have the Lord with us. Perhaps you felt lonely. Perhaps you've been denied by a close friend. You've tried to share the gospel at work. And somebody said, oh, well, if you're one of those, I'm not going to talk to you again. We've all been there. Not one of us here can say that we are greater than the next person, though. Ministry, in whatever form it takes, it's definitely not just ordained ministry. The church needs to repent of that because ministry is everything that we do in service. It's about service. One of my waking thoughts each day is, how can I serve the Lord best today? How can I serve his church today? It's not my church. It's not my vision. It's God's church. It's God's vision. It's God's direction on my leadership that sees us move. If we get that wrong, we're in dangerous territory. In these few verses that Emily read to us, Jesus turns the world's idea of greatness on its head. He turns it completely upside down. He shows us what Christian work and ministry is all about. It's about serving others. For me, I see my role as a member of the clergy to try and make myself redundant. That is my job in many ways. Because by doing that, it's encouraging and empowering each one of you to do what the Lord is asking of you in this season. Yes, there's certain things that I have to do in the Church of England, communion, etc. But essentially, I need to try and make myself redundant so that you are equipped and empowered to do what the Lord is asking of you, to serve the church, to serve each other, and to serve the community out there. It's time to take up our ministries within the church and outside of the church because there is a ministry for each and every person here. My role is to be a Barnabas to you, to support and encourage you, to guide you, to discern with you, not to tell you what to do, but to say to you, well, have you considered this? Pray about it. Don't give me an answer now. Sure enough, sometimes people come back to me and say, actually, I've prayed about that, Tim, and it's not for me. That's okay. That is okay. It is to encourage you to discover what is the Lord calling you to do? How can you serve God? How can you serve each other? It's one of the reasons I enjoy my work as an ADDO in the diocese because it's so much about having those conversations. And I think sometimes within the church, we don't necessarily have those conversations as much as we should do. But it's about discovering what, with an individual what the Lord is asking of them at a particular stage in their life. When we go on rotors in the church, it's not to try and become greater. It's out of service to the Lord. And I'm going to say this, dare I say, this is one of those things you think, really, Lord? And it may mean a mass exodus of people on the rotors. But if you are on a rotor and you feel it is a duty, come off. If it feels like a duty, the time's come to say, okay, Tim, I'm ha I've had enough. Don't all rush to email Leslie and say you want to give up everything. But it's time to step back if you feel it's become a duty. Because it should be a joy. Serving the church, serving each other should be a joy. Serving tea and coffee should be a joy. Cleaning the loos should be a joy. Standing and speaking should be a joy. Serving each other in a small group should be a joy. Cooking for each other should be a joy. Praying in, as an intercessor should be a joy. Washing up should be a joy. I struggle with that one. It should be joyful. We should serve with joy. 
I hope you don't come on a Sunday morning because it's the right thing to do. Oh, we've always gone to church, Tim. It's the right thing to do to go and sit down and sing some songs together and have a nice chat and have a little sip of wine and then have a nice cup of coffee and a biscuit. Why? That's not why we come to church, is it? We come to church on a Sunday morning to be with our family, to be with our brothers and sisters and to serve them. I don't see my preaching as an opportunity to tell you all what to do. I see it as a way of serving each of you with what the Lord has asked me to share. There are so many people who serve each Sunday morning. It's to make things happen. It's impossible to name everybody without missing someone out. At the APCM, I missed somebody out. Jane, thank you so much for the PCC secretary and for taking the minutes. I completely missed her out. It wasn't deliberate, but it's so easy to do, and I don't want to miss anybody out. I want to say thank you. King Charles said yesterday that he will serve and not be served. Yes, he has many people doing lots of jobs for him, but he dedicates his life to service. We in the church are here to serve and not to be served. We probably don't have servants running around after us or doing things for us, but we too can serve each other and our local community in ways that perhaps we don't even realize. Despite our own failings, though, despite the fact that we still sin, the sheer grace of the gospel means that God still works despite all of that. If you're sat here thinking, I'm not good enough. I sinned, I do this, I've done this, how on earth can I do it? Don't worry, because God can work despite of that. There was a wonderful poster we had up at Ridley in one of, the, one of the common rooms. You think you're no good for God? Well, I can't remember it all now, but Moses couldn't do public speaking, Noah was a drunk, etc., etc. This book is littered with people who say, I'm not good enough, but guess what? They become the giants of faith. What if some of us sat here are the giant of faith for 2023? What if one of us is going to go out and change the world in the way Billy Graham did? I'm sure you know the story of Billy Graham. Somebody said, well, come on, come to this meeting, and he, he changed the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. What is God asking you to do? Where can you stand and serve? How can you serve one another today? How can you serve one another tomorrow? How can we, I should be saying, not you, how can we serve one another? That's a mistake on my part. How can we serve each other, knowing that God will work despite us? It's strangely comforting to know with all the human failure that God will still work, and thank goodness for that. Maybe it's serving in this church. Maybe it's serving someone else. But I want to encourage you this week. Think, how can I serve someone else? How can I serve and not be served? What can I do to make a difference? It's not just something to do in church on a Sunday and go, okay, Lord, well, how can I serve you for the rest of the week? It's an ongoing thing. It's about keeping our eyes and our ears open to the Holy Spirit, no matter what we are doing. And listening for when he says, actually, you can serve that person by doing, packing the shopping bag at the checkout. You could perhaps serve that person by helping them walk across the road because they're a bit doddery and they need a bit of support. You could help that person by walking past, you know, with the, the people on the streets, you know, buy them a cup of coffee. It doesn't matter if it's not seen. It's not about seeing it from each other. Perhaps, like me, you've lost people who've been influential on your journey towards where you are now. Perhaps the Lord is saying, now is the time to step up and take on that mantle yourself and to start serving each other in new ways. Perhaps it's time to repent of the times we've failed to serve others when we feel like we should be served instead. What we witnessed yesterday was a reminder to the world. A reminder that no matter who we are in this world, no matter what status, no matter what privilege we have, we are here to serve a king. Not a king of this world, but one who came to walk on this earth. We are here to serve a king who was crucified, but
buried and resurrected so that we could come to know the Father. We serve a king who if he was to walk through those doors right now, I imagine he'd come in and go, right, what needs doing? Need some washing up doing? Do the loose need cleaning? I imagine that is what he would do. That's King Jesus who we serve. He comes to serve and not to be served. Are we willing to follow his way? Do we know his way? I was taken by the world's word said to Charles when he received the Bible, Sir, to keep you ever mindful of the law and the gospel of God as the rule for the whole life and government of Christian princes, receive this book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. Wow! Do we treat this book as the most valuable thing that this world affords? Do we treat this book as a book of wisdom? Do we treat this book as the lively oracles of God? It is the most valuable thing that the world affords. Do we open it and read it? Or does it sit gathering dust on a shelf somewhere? Let's learn to be more like Jesus. Let's learn to serve and not be served. Let's read the Bible and rediscover the lively oracles of God and the wisdom that he offers us for this world that we live in. If we do that, we can then be like our servant king, like King Jesus. Serve one another. It's not the way the world wants us to think, but that's okay. Charles was crowned yesterday to be a monarch who serves. Are we going to be crowned by Christ to be Christians who serve? Amen.